much to Priscilla and a very warm welcome to a rather cloudy Cape Town. This, of course, we're coming to you from the City Hall, the Cape Town City Hall, that is where this year's lecture, the 10th um, annual lecture of, uh, in honor of Nelson Mandela is, of course, um, being held, a place of uh, with its own peculiar history uh, among uh, the famous things that we know about this place, this city hall, is, the, is what uh, Criselda told you about this being where Nelson Mandela made his first speech, public speech, that is when he, after he came out of Robben Island. But this is also a hall that was built back in, 19, in, in 1905, perhaps the last uh, a monument, uh, if, if we may call it that, to have actually uh, to stand up um, last Victorian building ever to go up in this city. Well, without wasting any more of your time, the invitees are already here. Many, if not most, of the people who are attending this year's lecture are already here. But uh, for a bit of background uh, on this venue, here's a, 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 brief, a brief look. She might look a bit her age, but she is still the grand dame of Cape Town. The city hall is as part of the city as Table Mountain is. The hall is in the heart of the city and a neoclassical building designed in Renaissance style. Thousands pass her every day, but city hall's history shows why it remains such an icon. It's been a place of contestation, exclusion, but also um, inclusion, so to speak. Uh, the earlier struggles, basically, uh, that occurred in Cape Town, which were a reflection of what was happening in the broader South African uh, experience, play themselves out uh, you know, in the Cape Town City Hall. It was also home to the council where important and harsh decisions were made. People were not consulted, they simply had to find how they adjusted to the lack of consultation of political decisions taken here. So lives were basically destroyed, people were, families were torn apart because of decisions made here as well. Madida says the City Hall has always been a place of protest and contestation. Women also convened outside at the Grand Parade to protest, um, you know, against uh, the imposition of passes, but also food shortages in the 1940s. And certainly they, they were protesting facing the hall, which I think is important. Standing beside and not surprisingly, in 1990, it was the place where thousands of South Africans gathered to welcome Nelson Mandela following his historic release from prison. Friends, comrades, and fellow South Africans, I greet you all in the name of peace, democracy and freedom for all. I stand here before you not as a prophet, but as a humble servant of you, the people. Since the historic speech, the City Hall has always been a gathering space for protest. But protests aside, inside the City Hall, her architecture remains intriguing. The Bloomberg Room was also host to Queen Elizabeth's birthday. The City Hall has a long history that predates that. Um, and perhaps uh, one, of our, one of the highlights for the City Hall, though long before my time, um, is that Queen Elizabeth celebrated her 21st birthday. In the, in the City Hall. Heron says the City Hall is also home to the world-renowned Cape Philharmonic Orchestra, which regularly performs concerts here. The City Hall has now also become a place of culture and art. It's certainly no longer suitable to be the administrative capital or the administrative head office for the City of Cape Town. It just doesn't have the space, um, but it has a, a unique role to play in civic functions and in hosting events. I think it's important that the space is continuously used, right, so that people engage with it as well. I think that the fact that, you know, you've got the traffic department, you've got other uses, like such as, you know, concerts sometimes come in here. So it's now a space where people come together. I think this should be a space that pulls people together. You know, we may have our differences, you know, politically and otherwise, but I think engaging with the space 
um, will assist us in sort of building social cohesion, really. I think that that's important. Well, if you just tuned in, this is a broadcast of the annual Nelson Mandela Lecture, this of course being the 10th. Uh, dignitaries are already here, many if not most of them. Uh, you can see there on your screen the Premier of the Western uh, Cape, uh, Madam Helen Zille, uh, people like Mampela Rampela who are already here. The Deputy President of the country, Mr. Khalima Mutlante, has also arrived, but joining me now uh, Ngosi Umanda Mandela, who is the grandson to Holy Khalifa. Welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, another day to honor our stalwart Nelson Mandela. How does the family feel? Oh, we are truly humbled and uh, honored that uh, we are yet again celebrating uh, the 10th uh, Nelson Mandela annual lecture. Uh, which uh, is uh, uh, been uh, dedicated uh, to the work my grandfather has done uh, over uh, the many decades that is dedicated to uh, himself to a selfless struggle for liberation. And I think uh, uh, today, especially the topic focusing uh, more on freedom, truth, and our democracy, it is the work that my grandfather championed uh, soon after our transition in our early uh, days of democracy uh, when uh, he was talking about nation building and reconciliation. So we would uh, really uh, be interested as to uh, what uh, input would be given in today's session and how especially the younger generation today will utilize uh, such uh, 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 dialogues and such lectures to inform themselves as to how uh, we should be effectively running our democracy. Well, the purpose, one of the purposes of these lectures, of course, is to get that dialogue uh, um, going. Do you think that we're doing enough of talking as South Africans 18 years into democracy? Uh, not yet. I think uh, there's still a lot that uh, needs to be uh, engaged uh, that needs to be uh, brought out to the public uh, arena. We are seeing, especially in and around elections, that uh, most of our uh, people are not coming out to voting polls, and we need to really understand what is influencing that and impacting that. And I think uh, such dialogues enable people to get, gain an in-depth understanding of our democracy and what it seeks to do. And uh, 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 we hope that uh, with such lectures, it will uh, uh, engage and uh, uh, enable people to be able to fully understand uh, uh, that they do have a role. And when they come out to voting, uh, voting stations, they need to execute their mandate in ensuring that they are the defenders of this democracy. Now, uh, it also comes or happens at a time, of course, when the nation is grappling with a whole host of issues, things that uh, Nelson Mandela himself uh, feels uh, particularly strong about, and among those is, of course, the question of education. You know um, the situation in both the Eastern Cape and Limpopo. What, for you as the family, are the sort of things that perhaps the public should do, uh, one, in participating in the dialogues we're talking about, but also making sure that that things as such as education, which he feels particularly strongly about, are in fact dealt with or attended to? I think uh, one of uh, the key things uh, for, for us uh, as uh, uh, the young South Africans, we need to uh, remember that uh, my grandfather during his time built over uh, 206 clinics and uh, schools in rural uh, South Africa. And uh, we need to ensure that we preserve uh, those uh, institutions, uh, especially in the uh, 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 case of education, because my grandfather has always said that, uh, you know, education is a weapon one could use to change the world. And uh, we need to ensure that uh, as South African, we safeguard the future of our generation, because it is through that education that they will be able to fully participate in this democracy of ours. Very briefly, how is he doing now? <laughs> he's very well, thank you. And he's enjoying uh, his uh, 94 years, trying to get to uh, 95 years, and we are hoping that uh, it will be yet another successful year for us as a family, and we will see him through 
uh, this uh, uh, coming years to come. Thank you very much, Nkosi Omandla Mandela. Nongom Zugulwana Gaholishasha Nelson Mandela. Well, we now go to an insert that takes a look at the life of Mary Robinson, who is who will be delivering this year's lecture. That's why it's so important that the global community, the delegates here, will together address the past for the first time ever. A dedicated crusader for human rights. That's how many view Mary Robinson, the Irish lawyer, diplomat and activist. Ireland's first female president is better remembered in South Africa for presiding over Durban's 2001 World Conference Against Racism. Robinson ended her tenure as UN High Commissioner in 2002 after what was believed to have been sustained pressure from the U.S., among the thorny issues arising out of Durban was her criticism of the U.S. for violating human rights in its war on terrorism. And in turn, Robinson was condemned for the Durban Racism Conference's perceived anti-Semitism stance. Famously, she became the first head of state to visit Rwanda and in so doing brought world attention to the suffering in the aftermath of the 1994 genocide. Robinson serves on a number of global bodies, most notably as one of the elders, a group of world leaders convened by Nelson Mandela to use their leadership and integrity to tackle some of the world's toughest problems. The elders not only remind us of the Universal Declaration, but make it a living document connected with the problems of climate change and justice. She's also a board member of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, which supports good governance and leadership in Africa. Mary Robinson's work over the past four decades has assured her a place as one of the world's most respected intellectuals and rights campaigners. And my hope is that this group can help remind the world of these universal values that we all share and should be shared by all governments and implemented to resolve stubborn divides and conflicts. A look there at uh, the life and times of Mary Robinson. Well, joining us now is Professor Nzabulun Develo. Good morning, good afternoon to you, Prof. Good afternoon. Well, um, you have also come to pay tribute to this giant of our liberation struggle, Nelson Mandela, and you've been attending, in fact, I've seen you in most, uh, you've been attending most of uh, um, these, these lectures. What for you would stand out um, as the sort of thing that these lectures have been able to do in, in, in promoting dialogue about human rights and about democracy? Well, first of all, I think it's the quality of people that have been asked to speak on these lectures. They have been consistently of a very high order and uh, with varied uh, experiences. And that suggests that uh, the South African public is open then to be exposed to some of the most perceptive commentators on contemporary issues facing Africa and, and the world. And indeed, uh, many of some of the speakers have come from other parts of, of, of the world, as indeed is going to be this, our speaker this afternoon. I mean, how much of an insular, if you like, sort of society are we, and are we really open? In other words, when these people come, and people like Kofi Annan, Bill Clinton, Wangari Matai, and those people come here, do we really uh, take the dialogue um, beyond what um, these international scholars and, 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 and speakers actually would have, would have taken the dialogue? It's, it's difficult to say because a lecture by its very nature is a means to share ideas and to get people thinking about them. And whether people do something about that afterwards is another matter. But if you judge from the fact that uh, hundreds of thousands of people, both in South Africa and across the continent, have been watching these lectures every year, you can judge for yourself the, the distribution uh, that the, uh, the reach of this lecture is enormous and so it is a platform therefore a very effective one for, for getting the issues out there and I think that uh, I have found them extremely uh, fascinating 
and, and perceptive and insightful. And uh, I think more than ever in our country today, we need uh, those moments of reflection. Speaking of moments of reflection, I mean, at a time when uh, we're dealing, among other things, with the crisis in basic education, looking at the incidents in uh, both the Western Cape, I mean, in Eastern Cape and in the province of Limpopo, and a subject, of course, you've also written about in the education sphere. What is it that we should be doing, perhaps, or perhaps be doing more of as South Africans to really help in the field of education? Well, I like to think that the issue that faces uh, education is a very serious one and that each time one generation of South African young people is not exposed to the best that is possible means that somewhere down the line in the future our country loses something. I think we've got to register the seriousness of the issue because it's a the issue of, edu of poor education, you don't see its effects immediately. You see it down the line when you find that you need engineers, down, you don't have them. You need doctors, you don't have them. You don't see that right now. And, and, and that is the danger, the necessity for reflection, because you've got to be able to see beyond the now and then take effective measures to make the future possible now on the basis of what you envision. The problem also is that you don't want to focus only on the crisis. You want to focus on, on some of the reasons for, for the crisis, what the crisis itself may indicate. For me, it may indicate, among other things, that uh, the state of, of governance lacks coherence. Uh, we, we worry not only about education, we worry about how uh, the, it, it interfaces with, with arts and culture. We worry about the extent to which uh, the, 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 the security system in the country is, it interfaces with other things. In other words, the, the crisis in education is also could be seen as a commentary on the state of, 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 of the national governance and that if we see it only by looking at the textbooks that are being shredded, we lose the greater picture where the even bigger sense of agency might lie. In the, in the broader issues. Professor Njabulu Ndewele, thank you very much for chatting to us. Well, uh, we are in conversation with uh, some of the prominent academics and personalities that are attending the 10th um, and the 10th lecture in the annual series dedicated to the life of Nelson Mandela. Well, for now, we're going to cross back to Johannesburg where Criselda Lewis is anchoring the program from.
please cut off us, we're not ready. Can you get off us, please, Rafa? We're not ready. We're still putting up the tripod. So that nine standing by now. Chriselda Lewis from our Johannesburg studios. And while joining me now is Ravonia trialist Dennis Goldberg. Welcome to the program. Nice to be here. Nice to be with you. Well, another chance for you to pay a tribute to an old mate and comrade and someone you know very well. I think Nelson Mandela needs tribute paid to him. But I must tell you, I'm a little distressed about the format of the iconization of my comrade Nelson because it detaches him from the people. It says freedom is the gift of one man, Saint Madiba. And he was a man and a leader who mobilized the masses. It was the masses with great leaders who brought freedom. And it distresses me also that great as Nelson Mandela is, what about Oa Tambo? What about Walter Sisulu, Dr. Dadu, Red September? I'm deliberately mentioning people from all our communities. Uh, Brom Fisher. Uh, these are people with whom he worked intimately and discussed strategy. And this doesn't take away from the greatness of a leader such as Nelson Mandela or Oa Tambo, who, when a situation developed, that there seemed to be no way forward. 
they could find a way forward, the Youth League of the 1940s, they transformed the nature of the struggle. But they did it as a group. They grew up as a group. They were brothers in arms, politically and then literally, militarily as well, with a shared understanding and an ability to convince other people of the rightness of the move to mass action. And then Nelson Mandela and Joe Slovo and others decide on the armed struggle. It took a lot of persuasion to achieve the collective leadership, and that took the movement into the armed struggle. 30 years later, when the need was to start saving lives because of the brutality of the apartheid regime in its dying days, the man who calls for the armed struggle says, no, wait, let's negotiate. And OR was doing the same thing from outside. This was the nature of their understanding. What do you think? And so, so the point I'm trying to make is, please, let's not take Nelson Mandela away from the people or the people from Nelson, because we're demobilizing our people. And now, as we strive to build our democracy, we need to mobilize our people. What, what do you think is, how, how, do we, how did we get here? In other words, how did we get to a point where Nelson Mandela is being iconized and being taken away from the people, as you say? Well, it's nice to have a great hero to uh, hero worship. The media love it that way. It means that we can be superficial about the nature of politics. Somebody had a great idea and said this and then it happened. Uh, what about the 10,000 people murdered 1990 to 94 and they say we had a bloodless revolution? Now there are even people who are saying Nelson gave away too much in the negotiation. What did he give away? We could not defeat that system militarily, and they could not defeat our people. That's why we negotiated. And even then it was touch and go if the old apartheid security forces would accept the new regime, the new government. Now it's stable in power. People say, think it was like this in 1994. It wasn't. It was touch and go. Given an opportunity to perhaps correct that wrong, how would you go about doing that? I want us to teach the multi-stranded narrative of our struggle. And Quanta we Cesare played a role. The UDF played a role. I think we were wrong to do, dismantle the UDF. There was such a powerful people's movement there. We needed them, we need them now. And we need to rebuild it. We need to be talking history, and the academics are taking too long to approve every word, every sentence. You need people like me and Kathrada and Mlangeni and others who are in the struggle and in the next phase of it, be traveling and talking and talking. I do it whenever I can. We all need to be doing it. And it shouldn't be just a celebrity event. I would like to see the Nelson Mandela elect, uh, lecture in every capital of every province taken to the people to bring the people back into touch with the great leader, for example. And I think I think we need to go back to basics. I don't like the idea of a brand Mandela, that we fight about who owns the brand. He is a political leader of historic importance with great ideas, an intellectual leader. He read, he studied, he made notes, he wrote essays. He, uh, it all came out in the Ravonia trial, the extent of his studying for leadership. It's not just a, a whim, and it was part of a collective leadership. I want to see that restored. Satanis Goldberg, as interesting as always, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Satanis Goldberg, a Ravonia trialist, sharing his thoughts about how he thinks Nelson Mandela should be celebrated. It's time to have a look again at what's happening inside the hall where dignitaries and other people who have been invited are getting ready to listen to this year's lecture, of course, being going to be delivered by, Professor, by Mary Robinson, the former Irish president. Let's have a look. Well, from here, we'll get back to Criselda Lewis back in our, at our Johannesburg studios.
of thanks there to Criselda Lewis from our Johannesburg studio as well. Right here at the Cape Town City Hall, as you can see, there are some of the UDF generation, if you like. You can see Matthew Rube, you can see the J. Naidu, the former uh, General Secretary of um, uh, the Congress of South African Trade, un trade Unions. Uh, and so you, you also see, of course, a lot of other people, a lot of academics. And um, the lecture is about to start any time from now. Well, joining me now is Judge Albi Sachs to talk to us also about his view on how Mandela, Nelson Kholitlatla Mandela is being celebrated. This, of course, being the 10th um, in this lecture series. Can I just say, I saw Dennis Goldberg being interviewed and Dennis and I in the 1950s were in the modern youth society, it was called. And gosh, what a change since then. People say nothing's changed in South Africa. Uh, the change has been enormous. And Dennis, in fact, was very good with his hands. And as a result, joined M MK. He spent 23 years in jail, but he can look back on a transformed country that still needs further transformation. I was good, yak, 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 <laughs> talking and writing and thinking. Uh, and uh, my role was a different one, but I was blown up and in prison and in exile and all the rest. But we achieved something. And there were certain figures. In those days, Albert Lutuli, he was our hero. I'm a soldier of Lutuli. And, and I was, I'm a soldier of, of Lutuli. And then afterwards, it was Oliver Tambo and Nelson Mandela. But they symbolized something. They weren't these brave leaders who went out to the front and we blindly followed. It, it was a very active kind of a leadership, an interactive leadership. Yep. And uh, I used to go up to the office in Johannesburg, Mandela and Tambo, and see them as a young law student at the University of Cape Town. They were practicing. And our paths followed, separated, came together again. And Nelson Mandela, uh, he's still alive, he's still amongst us, and he, for the whole world, represents the spirit of never being dominated, the spirit of inquiry, the spirit of humanity, of humor, the spirit of style. He was always very stylish and elegant. Even when you met him in the underground, he'd have that big smile. He would never, if he was rattled, you never saw that he was rattled. And so we are so proud of what he's done. And I think everybody who took part in the struggle, big ways, small ways, long time, short time, we love to identify with him because he encapsulates everything that, that we were striving for. Well, Dan Skolbeck um, was expressing his displeasure at the way um, he's being iconized. Um, is, is it a view you share? No. Uh, Dennis and I used to disagree then. We disagree now in the most charming and friendly, interactive way. Uh, if iconizing him destroys his humanity, then that's bad for him and for the country. Well, he was arguing that it, it suddenly removes him from the people he... Uh... So that aspect of the icon, the icon is a figure, it's not a real person. But if iconizing him means it's the values that he stood for, the things he believed in, his style and manner of doing it, if that becomes a kind of exemplar, then there's nothing wrong with that. Now, yourself, as a member of the, of the judiciary, and a lot has been said about people's access to justice. Um, we've seen also politicians recently raising a whole host of other issues around transformation, the spirit and the letter of the Constitution. So what, what are your views, your personal views, if I may ask that? Well, I think one of the greatest achievements of our generation in struggle, the biggest of all, not I think, was the Constitution. And the Constitution has to be implemented. And I had the honor, the joy, the privilege of being on the Constitutional Court, uh, carrying forward that vision. For me, there was no break in my life, fighting for freedom, fighting for justice, defending the very values that we were espousing. And, and, and I think we have a most remarkable, I can say it now, I'm not on the court anymore, a most remarkable institution, the Constitutional Court of South Africa. I'm working in Kenya right now with the judiciary there. They look to South Africa, they look to the Constitutional Court. 
as a source of a, a body that is animated by the fundamental spirit of human dignity, equality, freedom, that's trying to find practical ways in a very unequal, very still very unjust society to constantly uplift the humanity of, of all the people who live here. So I think that's a very proud thing that South Africans can feel, is we have a strong judiciary, uh, it's, it's not immune to criticism, it, it's not immune to errors and faults, and surely I must have made errors, uh, done incorrect things myself, but it's basic role in our society and its basic integrity I think is unchallengeable. It's unchallengeable and it, it's something that gives heart and courage to all the people in all the different areas. There's this body that's not running for office, it's not campaigning, vote for me, I'm the best, or don't you dare vote for the others, they're terrible people and so on. We have a security of tenure, we have a great constitution, we have all of us, all the members of the court, a long history of decades of struggling for freedom and justice, and I think it, it's one of the pillars of the new democracy, and it keeps people steady and firm. You don't have to go out in the streets and kill each other. You can go to court and get your basic rights. I think that's an extremely important feature of our current society. And lastly, and very briefly, would you say that the way the discussions have been going, the way the judiciary has uh, handled themselves, people like you, and looking back with the benefit of hindsight, would you say, one, you're very much on track, and two, how do we proceed to get that conversation going, but without certain people feeling that the judiciary is being undermined? The judiciary has to be self-confident. Uh, it, it has to receive criticism, but not be diverted by criticism. Think about, reflect on what people are saying, and carry on. The courage of the judges is central to the whole judicial project. And that's a courage that you have, that you live, something that you feel. And, and people can say things, sometimes unjust things, sometimes the things that hurt the most are the things that are true. You've got to listen. You've got to have dialogue. Uh, we mustn't be separated from the society, but we must be bold and firm and convinced in what we do. Judge Albert Sachs, thank you very much for talking to us. Well, former judge in the Constitutional Court, but a struggle activist and stalwart in his own right, Albi Sachs. Well, let's, take a look. let's go back now to Chrysalda in Johannesburg. Yeah. <laughs> 
entering this show from Johannesburg, from our Johannesburg studio. Well, right here at the Cape Town City Hall, the guests are waiting. The lecture is about to kick off any time from now. And inside, the guests are seated, waiting for that call um, for the lecture to kick off. If we may just go inside, just to give you a brief look at uh, who is there, who are we still waiting for. But I can tell you that the Deputy President, uh, Mr. Khalima Mutlante, uh, the Western Cape Premier, uh, Madam Helen Ziller, as well as the uh, Mayor, are already here. Yeah. Are we going on are we going on air? Are we going on air? Explain. Say that again. When you say
I hear that. Which show? Yes. Hello and welcome to this special broadcast of the 10th annual Nelson Mandela Lecture. Well, the person who's going to deliver um, this year's lecture is, of course, Mary Robinson. For now, let's go inside for a bit of the national anthem. ask the photographers to give us some space. We really welcome all the support you give us. While they're moving out, um, the diplomatic course taught us one wonderful thing. It's that three words called all protocol observed. I would now like to uh, introduce the executive mayor of Cape Town, I have never been able to get used to calling her your worship. I always knew her as Comrade Patricia, so, but I have to bow to protocol today and invite the executive mayor to welcome us. The rest of the guests may take their seats. Good afternoon. Goedemiddag, Moleni. The Deputy President um, Halema Motlantle, the former President of Ireland and member of the Elders, Mrs. Mary Robertson, Mrs. Garasha Michelle and the Mandela family, Professor Jake Scherwell, Chairman of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Mr. Ahmad Dango, Chief Executive Officer of the Nelson Mandela Center for Memory, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great privilege to welcome all of you to Cape Town this afternoon. 
It is indeed an honor for this city to host the gathering of such celebrated and respected individuals. But perhaps the greatest honor of all is coming together to celebrate the legacy that Madiba continues to infuse into our society, not only here in Cape Town and South Africa, but globally. It was from this balcony of this very building, the City Hall of Cape Town, where Tata Madiba first gave his historic address upon being released from political imprisonment. This is a special significance that contributed to Tata Madiba being made a freeman of the city of Cape Town in 1997, where he has since been joined by the likes of Archbishop Desmond Tutu and President Barack Obama. But despite all these accolades and his historical significance, what has always struck me about Madiba is his great humility, with an ability to genuinely make others feel that they have greater importance than he does. The Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture provide an important opportunity for leaders to further our dialogue and debates on issues of social importance. It is through such forums that we advance our collective interrogation of the great questions that the intersections between the past, the present, and the future raise. For we cannot pretend that the problems raised and questions posed by our society can ever find absolute resolution. Indeed, as we search for answers, the questions change as much as we do. As society evolves, so too does our understanding of what needs to be addressed. In some ways, we become more sophisticated. In some ways, we become more simpler. And throughout, we must adapt and revise our preconceptions to ensure that we move to live the values to which we aspire of proper reconciliation, equality, and dignity. And in doing so, and through the lens that Tata Madiba provides us, we explore our humanity. Once again, I welcome all of you to Cape Town for the annual lecture and an undertaking that Tata Madiba and all that he represent for us. I thank you, Bayadanki and Kosikaku. Uh, thank you, Executive Mayor. It is now my pleasure to uh, call upon Professor Jake Scherville, um, the chairperson of the Nelson Mandela Foundation and Center of Memory, and one of Madiba's old chabas, not in age, but uh, in longevity, um, to in welcome you more officially and uh, to introduce the speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my duty and great honor to very briefly welcome you on behalf of the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory to this, the 10th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. And we joined in that welcome by our two sister organizations, the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund and the Mandela Rhodes Foundation. To start off with, I would like to invite you to watch a video about the work of the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory. We have traveled a long journey. We have fought for peace and reconciliation, for social justice, for all men, women, and children. 
to live together in harmony and with equal opportunity. These are ideals I still believe in, ideals that I still live for. But the time has come to fully hand over my work. Memory is a vital force in the life of people and nations and can help unite divided society. In our view, the work of archives in the South Africa of today is potentially one of the most critical contributions to restoration and reconciliation. All of us have a powerful moral obligation to the many voices and stories either marginalized or suppressed during the apartheid era. Today we are launching the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory Project. It will be run by the Nelson Mandela Foundation. We want it to be part of what we have called the processes of restoration and reconciliation. It is our hope that from these small beginnings it will grow into a vibrant public resource offering a range of services to South Africans and visitors from all parts of the world. We wanted to work closely with the many other institutions that make up the South African archival system. And most importantly, we wanted to dedicate itself to the recovery of memories and stories suppressed by power. That is the call of justice, the call that must be the project's most important shaping influence. The history of our country is characterized by too much forgetting, a forgetting which served the powerful and dispossessed the weak. One of our challenges as we build and extend democracy is the need to ensure that our youth know where we come from, what we have done to break the shackles of oppression, and how we have pursued the journey to freedom and dignity for all. For those of us who are older, and have lived uh, through the transition from apartheid to democracy. The processes of remembering offer us healing and a means of respecting the many comrades who made it possible. This is what archives are about. This is what we want the Center of Memory Project to be about. We will be grateful for any assistance in helping us to achieve this objective. I thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are proud to celebrate today a decade of high quality contribution to public discourse and deliberation through these annual lectures. We were privileged to have as our speakers over this decade persons of exceptional public stature, and today is no exception. There are a number of other features to this 10th annual lecture which makes it special. This is the first Nelson Mandela annual lecture which is hosted outside of Johannesburg. And its specific location and date, the Cape Town City Hall on this Sunday, the 5th of August, 2012, are themselves of special historic significance. The date marks exactly 50 years since Nelson Mandela was captured by the apartheid regime on Sunday, the 5th of August, 1962. He was incarcerated in police stations, court holding cells, and prisons from that day until the 11th of February, 1990, when finally he walked from Victor Fester prison, not far from here, 
as a free man. And today's venue is the very same city hall from the front balcony of which Nelson Mandela spoke to the world for the first time in over 27 years on that historic day in February 1990. The 10th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture, therefore, carries in its conceptualization and in its planning profound resonances of history, geography, and biography. There are resonances which we have invited our speaker to engage, and there are resonances which we are confident will enrich everyone present here today. Let me then introduce our esteemed speaker, Ms. Mary Robinson. Mary Robinson served as President of Ireland from 1990 to 1997, and as United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights from 1997 to 2002. She's a member of the grouping, the Elders, and of the Club of Madrid, and is a recipient of numerous honors and awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama of the United States. She is the Honorary President of Oxfam International. She's Chancellor of the University of Dublin and serves on the boards of a number of organizations, including the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. She's a former president of the International Commission of Jurists, a former chair of the Council of Women World Leaders, and the founder and first president of Realizing Rights, the Ethical Globalization Initiative. It is my very great pleasure to now invite Ms. Robinson to address us. Honourable Deputy President, Honourable Executive Mayor, my sister elder, Grasa Michelle, trustees of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, people of South Africa, particularly young people. When I was invited to deliver the 10th Nelson Mandela Foundation lecture, I felt daunted, both by the honour of marking with you the 10th anniversary here in this historic town hall of Cape Town and by the distinguished list of speakers who have gone before. Uh, those of you who know me, and there are some friends in the audience who know me, know that I am not easily daunted. And I haven't been as daunted as this for a long time. Uh, I feel a great connection to South Africa. Next only to my native county, country, Ireland, this is the country I have most grown to love for its historic victory over the evil of apartheid and its promise of a rainbow nation, for producing two great moral giants of my lifetime, Nelson Mandela, Madiba himself, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who chairs the group of elders to which I belong. I also have close personal friends here, and a beloved niece is married to a South African and will soon have her first South African Irish child in this country. So I am very grateful to the Centre of Memory of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, although I must say they have posed quite a challenge for me. In the 1960s, I studied law in Trinity College, Dublin, and was taught by Kader Asmal, who instilled in me the values of rule of law, due process, equality, and non-discrimination, values so well enshrined in your admirable constitution. Kader and I became friends, and I joined him in the anti-apartheid movement he and his wife Louise founded in, in, in Ireland. So began my particular interest in South Africa's affairs. As a young senator, I became involved in the European and African parliamentary grouping AWEPA, initially established to fight apartheid, and now focused on strengthening the capacity of parliaments in Africa. In 1994, as president of Ireland, I was honored to represent Ireland at the inauguration of President Nelson Mandela. I will never forget the occasion. Everything about it was special. The taking of the oath by the country's beloved Madiba, the rows upon rows of South Africans of all races singing together as one, 
and the military fly past and salute that caused a huge visceral roar from the crowd below. Since then, I've had many reasons to visit regularly, and I even have an academic connection as an extraordinary professor at the University of Pretoria, linked to its Center for Human Rights and its Center for the Study of AIDS. I feel it necessary to set out my credentials as a friend, because my challenge today is to speak to you, South Africans, as your friend. A true friend tells you not only what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. Clearly, the concepts of freedom, truth, and democracy have a particular resonance for the Republic of South Africa. Freedom, of course, evokes Madiba's own long walk, and the struggle and sacrifice of ordinary South African citizens, unsung heroes, who stood up against a brutal regime to win their freedom, physical freedom from imprisonment in Robben Island, and political freedom from the shackles of apartheid. Truth brings to mind South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the first of its kind designed to enable the people to come to terms with the past, admit the truth about atrocities and gross human rights violations, and start the process of reconciliation. But it seems, and understandably, given the circumstances, that this process only really scratched the surface, and South Africa remains, as my friend Dr. Rampele puts it, a nation of wounded people. Democracy puts in mind those long queues at polling booths in 1994 all over the country, the tangible excitement as the majority of people voted for the first time. It puts in mind South Africa's constitution, admired around the world for the way it values human dignity and frames human rights at its heart. It puts in mind the promise of a rainbow nation at peace with itself and the world, symbol of the possibilities for transformation, reconciliation, and national unity. But we need to ask ourselves, is this young democracy living up to those high expectations and ideals? As a human rights person, the term freedom also calls to mind the four freedoms identified by US President Franklin D. Roosevelt in his State of the Union address given in 1941, a time of world crisis. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear, which, translated into world terms, means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. I've always emphasized that freedom from want is a core part of human rights, as affirmed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, including rights to food, safe water, health, education, and shelter. In spite of the innovative provisions of the South African Constitution, can it be truly said that freedom from want has been adequately secured for all in the past 18 years? In the context of ideas of freedom and democracy, of citizenship and common purpose, inherent in the concept of truth is the need for transparency and accountability in government action. In order for citizens to remain the stewards of democracy, issues of accountability and transparency in governance are key. It is therefore with great concern that I have followed the progress of South Africa's protection of state information legislation, knowingly styled by its detractors as the Secrecy Act. Perhaps it's not my place to pronounce on the levels of corruption at play in today's South Africa, but from my experience as a human rights lawyer, I can give you a certainty. If you enact a law that cloaks the workings of state actors, that interferes with press freedom to investigate corruption, that stifles efforts by whistleblowers to expose corruption, you are sure to increase those levels of corruption tomorrow.
the public interest demands that basic truth of having both transparency and accountability in government. Secrecy is the enemy of truth in this regard. Another aspect of truth is admitting mistakes. My own country, Ireland, is going through a very difficult time, struggling to recover from financial collapse and the humiliation for a proud nation that experienced its own fight for freedom and democracy in the early 20th century of having to be bailed out by the IMF, European Union and European Central Bank, thereby ceding a part of its hard-fought sovereignty. The downward spiral of the economy happened quickly. People are angry and they are hurting. Many households find themselves in neg negative equity, unable to meet mortgage payments and household bills. Small businesses have closed and many are still closing in cities and towns. The cutbacks required to meet the financial targets imposed on Ireland as part of the bailout package are hurting the poorest and most vulnerable in particular. Where a decade ago we had almost full employment, unemployment is once again a scourge and emigration is back as a reality for a new generation of Irish people. Mistakes were made during the boom years. We somehow lost our way, became obsessed with personal wealth and material possessions. Now, as part of the national conversation, we have to acknowledge these mistakes as we try to regain a sense of ourselves. The Irish, I'm glad to be able to say, the Irish are a resilient people, and I believe we will come out of this difficult time feeling stronger, and I hope more compassionate. To do that, we are in some sense reinventing ourselves, lifting ourselves up again by playing to our strengths. Every country has the capacity and sometimes the need to reinvent itself. Today, the 5th of August 2012, is the 50th anniversary to the day of the capture of Nelson Mandela, lawyer, activist, leader, vocal opponent of the apartheid regime. As we commemorate that anniversary, I would like to dwell for a moment on the nature of anniversaries. Anniversaries are a good time to take stock. They can also be a good time to look at ways to reinvent, to reinvigorate, to renew an earlier spirit. In December 1997, very near the beginning of my term as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, I chose to launch the year-long celebrations of the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights here in South Africa, alongside President Nelson Mandela who was then launching South Africa's National Plan of Action for Human Rights. In that plan of action was stated, among other things, the following. Democracy is irreconcilable with racial inequality and social injustice. Democracy is incompatible with poverty, crime, violence, and the wanton disregard for human life. Democracy is strengthened and entrenched when society is fully aware of its fundamental human rights and freedoms and lays claim to these. As you know, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the African National Congress, the ANC, founded in 1912 to defend and advance the rights of African people. Leader in the struggle to destroy the apartheid state with a vision to replace it with a united, non-racist, non-sexist, democratic and prosperous South Africa in which the people as a whole shall govern and all shall enjoy equal rights. What the ANC has achieved in those hundred years is remarkable. From the defiance campaign, the resistance movement, armed struggle, banishment, to becoming the governing political party since 1994, leading the way in transforming the country according to that vision. Sadly though, in recent years, my South African friends tell me the ANC's moral authority has been eroded, tainted by allegations of corruption, a temporary betrayal of its history. And meanwhile, there remains in the transformation process much unfinished business. We cannot deny that South Africa faces serious problems. I read about them in the newspapers. I hear about them from my South African friends, and I see evidence of them with my own eyes. The scourge of poverty with which, as that national plan of action stated, democracy is irreconcilable, has been a central theme of my human rights work, 
so undermining is poverty of human rights. Where you witness extremes of wealth side by side with dire poverty within the same country, it is more divisive than an overall condition of poverty. Last year, I came here to South Africa to attend my beloved niece's wedding. Before joining the party, I was invited by Manfela Rampele to visit part of Eastern Cape, where I sat with her, listening in on the Litsima Circle Pathfinder initiative. I was taken aback by the poverty of the surroundings and deeply impressed with this initiative. From there, I traveled to the town of Parle for the family wedding and was even more taken aback by the shocking disparity I witnessed from abject poverty to luxurious gated wealth. My friends tell me that the levels of crime and violence in some areas, Lavender Hill, say, or Kailiche, where my son Aubrey worked for a number of years with a local organization, Mamalani, mean that people are living in unmanageable, traumatic situations. School learners sitting on the floor so that they don't get caught in the crossfire. Local community members resorting to vigilante justice, the dreaded necklace. Situations that need to be addressed before those people can feel free and participate as active citizens in South Africa's democracy. But I need to bear in mind what we all should remember, that the Republic of South Africa is a very young democracy, just 18 years old. It is also a democracy, the majority of whose rapidly increasing population consists of young people. It's hard to address all the structural problems and inequalities in such a short time. Still, you need to ask yourselves some uncomfortable questions. Why is South Africa's education system underperforming? Why are the rates of illiteracy so high? What has caused the culture of non-attendance and resistance to learning? How has such disparity in the allocation of resources been allowed to occur? How can the inequities in the system be resolved so that every South African child has equal access to quality education? How can the teachers' union be motivated to drive efforts towards positive change? Those questions need to be addressed if South Africa's hard-fought democracy is to be sustained for generations to come. You have both the positive resource and the acute problem of a young population with high unemployment and a deficit of skills. There are no simple solutions, and I don't begin to have the local knowledge to construct the multi-layered approach needed. Those young people who feel discouraged need to be given a positive sense of self and the support and resources needed to complete their education, to learn the necessary skills, and then access a job market and one where there are jobs to be found. As young citizens, they should enjoy positive relationships and a sense of engagement as part of being citizens or residents in a modern South African state. But I don't stand here to preach, even though I may sound at times as if I am preaching. I prefer to encourage. South Africa has shown itself to be a resilient nation. It has also shown itself to be an exceptional organizer of world events. And I'm not just talking about football, the Football World Cup. Two world conferences steered by South Africa in Durban have led the way to achieving significant improvements in the global conversation on the issues of racism and of climate. I recall vividly serving as Secretary General of the World Conference Against Racism in Durban in September 2001, ably chaired by Dr. Lemini Zuma, who is now breaking new ground as the first woman president of the Commission of the African Union. It was a difficult conference, and when the United States and Israel withdrew, it would have collapsed without the skillful and committed leadership of South Africa, a country which understood profoundly how vital it was to secure the Durban Declaration and Program of Action to counter racism in all its forms. I was happy to return to Durban last November for COP17 on climate change, again ably chaired by a South African woman, Maiti Mashaban, which was able to forge with difficulty the Durban Enhanced Platform for Action, under which all countries committed themselves 
to a new climate agreement by 2015 to come into effect by 2020. It is not strong enough or urgent enough to deal with the looming disaster of climate change, but few going into Durban last November had predicted this agreed outcome, which proves that you should never underestimate South Africa's, and particularly South Africa's women's, capacity to bring about <laughs> remarkable <laughs> results. Therefore, I have every faith that South Africa, endow endowed as it is with such a wealth of resources and a resourceful population, can acknowledge its mistakes, face up to its problems, engage in a national conversation, and continue the process of transformation that has so inspired the watching world. Which brings me to citizenship and common purpose put into practice, which are the essential bedrock to realizing these basic concepts of freedom, truth, and democracy. To quote another Roosevelt, this time Eleanor, as she spoke about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at the United Nations, New York, in 1958. Where, after all, do universal rights begin? In small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world yet they are the world of the individual person. Now, it's here in this quote that I always have to stop and say it's not gender sensitive, but it was 1958, and Eleanor was doing her best. So I read it as it is, even though every time I read it, it kind of gets me. Uh, so I'll begin that sentence again. Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory farm or office where he works. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerted citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. The concerted citizen action called for requires engagement by the people with the process of government in all its forms starting with the very local. But with such contrasts of extremes, as I alluded to earlier, it's not difficult to understand the disengagement and apathy of many citizens living in those unmanageably traumatic situations. To me, an outsider, but a genuine friend, South Africa is a nation of paradoxes. When I hear about the tireless work of the many non-governmental organizations, youth groups, women's groups, working with local communities, or working at a national level. I think civil society in South Africa is thriving. But then my South African friends tell me wider civil society is often disengaged. What are religious leaders saying and doing about South Africa's problems? What are the professions saying? What are the unions saying? Are they doing enough? Are they truly working to hold government to account for the inequities, the imbalances, the injustices they witness close to home? Or are they more concerned with their own survival, their own advancement, to the detriment of the wider common purpose of achieving a constitutional democracy, that vision of a united, non-racist, non-sexist, democratic, and prosperous South Africa? Article 29 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights declares that everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of his personality is possible. This is echoed in South Africa's constitution, where it provides that all citizens are A, equally entitled to the rights, privileges, and benefits of citizenship, and B, equally subject to the duties and responsibilities of citizenship. Mehel is an Irish word that describes a traditional rural practice of people coming together to work, farmers lending support to their neighbors as the need arises. It expresses the idea of community spirit and self-reliance. I can remember, as a child, going out with my father, a doctor, on his calls to rural areas at harvest time. Practically everyone would be working in a particular field to save the hay, the women bringing sweet tea and bread and jam. If a farmer was sick, his field would be done willingly by neighbors. I find Mehel similar to the African ethic of Ubuntu, the idea of human interconnectedness and solidarity, described in the phrase which Archbishop Tutu 
often uses with us the phrase, I am because you are. Mehel and Ubuntu are deep-rooted traditional approaches that can be harnessed towards a vision of citizenship <clears throat> that involves active participation in a society in which citizens enjoy personal rights and freedoms and they discharge the correlating duties and responsibilities towards a common purpose of a sustainable future. <clears throat> Here in South Africa, as in many countries around the world, there is a distinct lack of trust in traditional institutions of democracy, such as in the ability of parliament and local authorities to tackle corruption and inequality. But the good news is, the good news is that technological innovations can empower ordinary people as never before and can introduce new ways of holding government and local authorities accountable. Social media can, now provides the ability to connect individuals to the knowledge and resources they need electronically. Cell phones allow people to communicate with one another and to connect to the internet by friending, tweeting, collaborating in ways that are far beyond me as a mere elder, but many of you, particularly the younger among you, will know what I mean, um, the extraordinary ability uh, to be in touch and to communicate. Now we are witnessing new internet platforms being created which enable people to become data providers and fact checkers. One of the most impressive is Ushahidi, which came about in response to calls from Kenyan bloggers to repurpose Google Maps, sorry, to repurpose Google Maps for Kenya, to identify where violence was occurring and the extent of it today. Today, Ushahidi software has been repurposed for everything from disease mapping to many types of crisis mapping around the world. I was intrigued to learn recently that a local authority in Ireland is using Ushahidi to map potholes on roads in their area. Potholes can be quite a problem um, in different parts of my country. The potential of this technology to map and provide data on incidents of corruption, on non-attendance of teachers at schools and so on could make these problems much more visible and increase the possibility of accountability. Of course, those with access to these innovative technologies tend to be the middle class. But we know from history that it is often a frustrated middle class which rises up to demand better quality of services and necessary structural change. When we think of citizenship, we think of a definition based on nationality of a particular country. But my view is that in the 21st century, we need a new concept of citizenship that embraces all of those people who find themselves in the country, nationals and migrants alike. <clears throat> this is particularly relevant to countries like South Africa, a go-to country with a strong economy that attracts and will continue to attract a large migrant population. In the 2001 Durban World Conference Against Racism, steered by South Africa, the strongest international statement yet was applied to the rights of migrants. Yet, in the decade since then, in real terms, there has been a marked deterioration in migrant status, whether by Europe erecting further barriers to entry, whether by the United States enacting harsher laws against what it terms illegal aliens, from Mexico and other parts of Latin America, or whether by rising xenophobia in African countries, including South Africa. Roughly ha half of any country's citizenship is made up of its women. And I'm glad that South Africa celebrates August as Women's Month, and you have much to celebrate. I've already mentioned several notable South African women, and I could list many more, both in the past struggle and today. It's not just true of South Africa, but of African countries generally, that women's leadership is coming into its own. I fully agree with my elder sister, Grasa Michel, when in an interview in October 2011, she stated, I think that in 10 years' time, Africa will be a completely different landscape. It's already happening with regard to women. Skillful and ambitious women will be at the highest levels of decision-making in politics, business, science, and technology there's a new generation of female leaders coming. She's right. 
A UN panel report in February 2012, Resilient People, Resilient Planet, A Future Worth Choosing, highlighted the importance of women's economic empowerment globally in this way. Any serious shift towards sustainable development requires gender equality. Half of humankind's collective intelligence and capacity is a resource we must nurture and develop for the sake of multiple generations to come. The next increment of global growth could well come from the economic empowerment of women. Yet to come back to my observation that South Africa is a nation of paradoxes, I ask you, how could this be the same country where an article entitled The Big Read, A Lousy Land for Women can be published? The article notes a further paradox. Women are doing well in representative positions. 41% of the cabinet are women. Five of the nine provincial premiers are women and 42.3% of the seats in the lower house of the South African Parliament are occupied by women. And yet, as you well know, there is a darker picture. Twice as many women as men have HIV and 66,196 cases of sexual offences were reported in 2010-2011, some involving rape of very young children. The article refers to a 2009 gender study of South Africa by the African Development Bank and quotes it as stating, the focus on representative equality has dominated the discourse, whereas less energy seems to have been turned towards implementation of policies that would effectively change the lives of the majority of women. This is clearly a challenge which women leaders in South Africa must take up, not just political leaders, but women in business, in law, in the unions, and in leadership at local level. And not just women, men too, must see this as a priority. Sustainable development can only be achieved when there is zero tolerance of gender-based violence and a full commitment to gender equality. It's possible now, and I talked about this a few moments ago, to map incidents of violence and to track them through social media. This is Women's Month, and I'm confident that my South African sisters will again surprise us. Your admirable constitution opening opens with stirring words. We, the people of South Africa, believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. As you approach your early 20s, and you are a young democratic country in that sense, as you approach your early 20s, you have an opportunity to draw on your strengths, renew that inspirational vision that the world stood in admiration of in 1994 and continue to build your rainbow nation block by block. Some time ago, I read the memoir of another extraordinary South African friend, Pregs Govender, Love and Courage, Story of Insubordination. I'd like to finish with a passage she used in relation to her own personal journey, which I believe can be transposed to the journey that many South Africans may also have taken. <clears throat> The worst experience I had sent me spiraling, yet it had also deepened the journey within and awakened love from which courage flowed. Memory had surfaced and beyond it, the glimpse of the truth that none of us are fixed in heroic or despotic moments of history. Life, as it waxes and wanes, always provides opportunities for our humanity to emerge. I have ever... <clears throat> I think I'll repeat that last sentence from, from the quote. Life, as it waxes and wanes, always provides opportunities for our humanity to emerge. I have every confidence in South Africa realizing the opportunities for its humanity to fully emerge. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you, Mary Robinson. And I see some of my trustees sitting in front here, and they probably will say, we told you so, <laughs> because we had a big debate about how we would repeat last year's performance, especially in the 10th uh, annual lecture, and uh, this group of people decided on Mary Robinson, and they were absolutely right. So thank you, Mary. <clears throat> There are a few things we always have to do, and let's thank the people who make this possible um, before the Sopranos come on. I'd like to thank our core sponsor who made this uh, possible, SAP Africa, and of course the city of Cape Town, who has made not only the venue available, but a lot more things available, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And then Audi South Africa, um, not only for their cars, but for their astute driving skills. I've never seen anybody uh, navigate blue lights like they do. Nashua Central, Coca-Cola, Rupert and Rothschild, Vodacom. I also would be, uh, I must if I didn't thank our team, the Center of Memory team, Cello and Molly uh, and colleagues, and, and also I'd like to thank Sean Johnson, my um, fellow CEO of the Mandela Rhodes Foundation for the support he and his staff have given us. They, without, uh, without them, we wouldn't have been able to make it as well. So thank you very much. Um, and of course, I want to thank the SABC. This will now be broadcast in an hour from now. Uh, because of other problems, but it has been recorded and will be broadcast at 6.30. I would now like uh, to call upon a group of singers who have given them the name, themselves the name the South African Sopranos. Um, I'm sure they were South African, but the fact that they call themselves South African Sopranos show not only their talent, but their patriotism.
There, there is one more song to come, but uh, if our stage guests would like to leave for reasons of state, you're welcome to do so, or Mrs. Marshall's eyes tells me she wants to sit. Okay, <laughs> please continue. <laughs> Thank you very much. Fitting end to what was a, dare I say, an uproarious lecture. <laughs> um, we don't know what we're going to do next year, uh, but I guess our trustees will give us the guidance again, because again, I don't know how we're going to outdo Mary Robinson. Um, well, this is the end of the 10th annual lecture, except for one thing, courtesy of the city, there's refreshments. Apparently, if you want to participate or enjoy the refreshments, you have to leave through the right-hand side. Uh, there's no food on the left-hand side. <laughs> okay. And uh, so thank you all for coming, and I would ask you just to remain seated while our stage guests uh, leave uh, through there. Okay. Thank you.